I'm seen to be more negotiating. I cannot go to the tribesmen and handle them directly because I have to work through the sheikhs who control them. This is not what soldiering is really about, right? But he makes a tremendous adjustment. So one Arab officer writes, he really understood our culture. And in that midst, he said to, in the letter to his friend, there is nothing more that I appreciate and love in warfare than its artistry. In other words, these challenges of, the, of another culture, having to work as a soldier statesman and not just a soldier with tribesmen, I'm thriving in it. This is my calling. And that gives you insight when things are bad, you say, I'm in the right place because the good outweighs the bad. Now, this attempt to have insight uh, and understand the nature of things, I'd like to share one other thing that I found. Uh, it, it is in the published do uh, domain. In 1916, as a uh, corps commander fighting out in Anatolia against the Russians, in his notebook, he writes about some of the things that he has read. He reads, is it possible to deny God the elements of philosophy? And he writes notes of the different types of philosophies that there are. He talks about the naturalists, the rationalists, the materialists, the legalists, the intellectuals, and the mystics. What does a soldier need about that? There is a philosophy of war, but this is philosophy in war. And it is not military <coughs> subjects. I think it captures that as he was developing as a soldier, working hard to understand what it needs, what you have to know to be an effective soldier. He at the same time was not myopic as one of his teachers said, don't just think about military subjects, think about things in a larger context, okay? So that that logical critical reasoning gets at the essence of things. And some of the great statesmen can move all the different kinds of secondary issues and focus in on what is essential. And I think this is one of the characteristics that Anatoly was trying to develop through study of critical reasoning. Now, how does, uh, maybe, uh, I'll just share one more quick story. Uh, just to capture it, uh, his chief of staff, Izzedi, uh during uh, World War I, uh, writes in his notebook, he had a serious discussion about the future, about what women would be like in New Turkey, or uh, let's see, what reforms for women. And later on, shortly thereafter, he writes in his memoirs, a notebook, that he thought about Aristotle and Descartes, and he had several books from him that you know he got from Ataturk. Two were on philosophy and one was on psychology. Okay, now let's look at the war part. Uh, one of the things that's interesting about Ataturk is that though he was involved in some revolutionary activity, he was a serious student of warfare. As a young officer in 1909, he begins a translation of uh, one of two manuals which he finishes. It's a German uh, translation of platoon tactics. Then he does one on uh, company tactics, which is the next level. And he was gonna do one on battalion, but I don't think he ever got to it, or if he did, uh, I haven't seen it. And it's interesting that while all this politics was swirling around, He's thinking about small units and preparing small units for warfare. Just like the peasant, an individual, small, the smallest unit needs to be thought about, prepared, and trained. Now, uh, if you read uh, the next thing, this is his best book on warfare. It's Conversations with command, uh, Commander, Officer and a Commander. Uh, and in there, he explains, in a way, indirectly, why he focused in on small unit tactics. He said, the nature of war is complex. There are surprises. And the surprises first happen not with brigadier generals, not with colonels, but happen at the point of the arrow, at the point of the spear with small units. And then those surprises filter up to the top. So why was he spending time on small units? Because he understood their importance in the conduct of war. 
Now, let me just mention one command that everyone knows, and then I will come back to why I think this is important. We all know Gallipoli. Uh, this is a World War I, <coughs> the Ottoman Empire. One of his most famous commands, this is me getting ready to go on a tour with an officer and a guide <coughs> campaign where he really uh, makes a name for himself, committing the uh, division without the orders of his commander and uh, helps prevent the peninsula from being cut in half, takes initiative, and he makes this very famous command, which I, a student told me recently is voted the most famous command by many people, no, was voted number one, I am not ordering you to fight, but I'm ordering you to die. By the time we die, other forces and commanders will take our place. Order to die command, very famous. Now, um, this is him at uh, Gallipoli and then a statue to him. This is where the landing took place, difficult. The Australians had troubles. Uh, I'm gonna jump forward now to world, uh, the War of Independence. <laughs> This is a command that when I found it, it also blew my mind. And I would say it's one of three powerful commands. The first one is the Gallipoli command, then the, this one, and then I'll talk about the one that says, go to the Mediterranean after as the Greek army is being defeated. This is on my own personal perspective. Why is this important? It takes place three days on the 20th of uh, August before the Battle of Sakarya. I think I could do this. Well, I, I think I'll do it this way. Uh, the Battle of Sakarya, the Greeks are coming, and he has to defend the uh, center of Ankara. So this is going to be the key battle that, by winning this battle, the strategic initiative moves into the hands of the Turks. This is the famous statue and a picture of him at the Battle of Sakarya. This is a place where he falls off his horse. One of the beauties of traveling is you always have friends going with you and you meet villagers. Uh, this is the area around Sakarya. And there's the local villagers coming in and showing hospitality. So studying the dead brings you in contact with the living. It is wonderful to be in Turkey. Uh, let me talk about this order. It's a critical battle. You don't want to lose Ankara to the Greeks. You have soldiers coming in from all other fronts to concentrate to set up defenses. You're having soldiers come in who've never seen battle before. Soldiers that have been fighting guerrillas and coming in now to fight a regular army. And I, if I was back at the staff college, I would ask my soldier or officer students, what command would you give to this army being rushed from all over? And when I did a thing in Ankara, I asked the Major General of our military mission to invite all the American officers and do an exercise. I brought out this order, and the Air Force people, pardon me, I hope there's no one in the Air Force, they kind of flew by them, they wouldn't appreciate it. But the Army officer said, that is a perfect command, but not one that one would give. It has four parts, and what he says is, in point number two, forward and reverse fluctuations at some points along a general line of battle are not unexpected events. What, what he is saying, basically in this command, is we cannot hold every position. The situation has changed from Gallipoli. We'll die in place, but we're not gonna move. And what he's saying then is, and here I think he's playing the role of what he said in his uh, conversation book, that the commander has to be like a father. You have to mentor your soldiers. And he says, don't worry about this. This is normal. So if you lose a position, don't panic. Accept it as normal. And if you see it happening to the guy next to you, respond with infantry and artillery, combined arms, wisdom, right? They didn't have tanks, then no planes and then support the person next to you. So what he is basically telling the army, and he says, I want this command disseminated throughout the army, is I want to prepare them emotionally and intellectually for the reality of war. Not to tell them what to do, but to prepare their hearts and minds 
and souls, if you will, for the upcoming battle. And be prepared realistically. That's what they need more than anything else. Powerful. And then he tells the officers, when you make a decision, make sure your mind is calm. And understand your duty and responsibility, what you've been told to do. And if you see how he has written sometimes when he's training, he wants soldiers, officers, to take orders and absorb them, study them for a period of time. So they become part of your soul. And then if that happens, and you have to take the initiative, you're going to be able to do it more in line with what the senior commander wants rather than panicking and letting your emotions drive you. You can see, at least from my point of view, this is a powerful command. I would say, take Gallipoli, but don't throw this one out. Put it side by side, uh, because it is preparing an army that's going to be facing a major battle. The, the, it's powerful. Uh, I hate to, what can you say, but yes, so I guess when you're looking, you look that, okay. Uh, what he says, during moments of intense combat, commanders must carefully exercise their duty and authority, and there he says, with mature composure and calm, okay? Now, uh, this is a message he will be giving to the Republic after he establishes it. Now, what I'd like to uh, move next to and these are more difficult to talk to about is conscience and uh, sentiment, emotions. As I said before, what struck me as I thought about how often Ataturk uses conscience, it would be something that maybe today some people ask, well, what would Ataturk do? I, would, I don't know what Ataturk would do today, but I'll tell you one thing he would tell Washington, D.C., where is your conscience? Where is your shame? Where is your honor? Those words would fly, right? But today, when I try to use it after being influenced by Arthur, where's your conscience? It just kind of goes over people because we're not used to thinking along those lines. And we know the problem is one person's conscience is not another's. Uh, what Arthur understood, and you look at it, is when you analyze things, it's not just reason, but it's also conscience. You have to be aware of the values that you have that are driving your analysis, right? And that suggests a certain sense of ability to know what your biases are, okay? And I discovered uh, just before I left Turkey that Ataturk read a book when he was a young captain. First assignment after getting out of the uh, war, academy, war college, no, no, the staff college, the staff college, 1907, around 1907, he reads a book on Benjamin Franklin in Ottoman. And he has four pages of notes in his notebook, which is a lot for that notebook on one subject. It's more than anything, I think, on any other subject. And what he, in a way, Ataturk, you could say, was a person of the Enlightenment, right? And what better person in American history, Mr. American, than Benjamin Franklin, right? He lists all the accomplishments or the areas where uh, Benjamin Franklin excelled, including pottery, diplomacy, lightning rod, stove, all those kinds of things. But what is also interesting is he lists all 13 of Benjamin Franklin's virtues. And for everyone but one, gives a definition. This is what? Trying to develop your character, being self-conscious of who you are as a person, and looking to the wisdom of others to help you perhaps in that process of self-reflection, self-analysis. And some of the ones probably fit out of Turk, and other ones probably do not. Uh, the last one was humility. He didn't put anything down for humility. <laughs> And if you look at Franklin, he says, imitate Socrates and Jesus. <laughs> yeah. You can see why that one didn't make it. Okay, uh, a couple of ones, cleanliness. One of the things that struck our officer named Townsend who comes to visit Ataturk during the War of Independence is his troops were better dressed, 
more manicured, if you will, than other troops. Outward appearance was important because it reflected inner discipline, does it not? Does it not? Okay. Um, oh, maybe I, I did miss one thing on, on conscience. He captured um, the Greek commander in the War of Independence. He walks up to him, and I say he reaches out, not a helping hand, but a consoling hand. This is what he says to General Tricopas. If you are convinced that you carried out your duty in accordance with your conscience, then you could be at peace with yourself. History has recorded even the greatest commander's falling prisoner. I can, for example, show you Napoleon. See, 